But first, I want to take you to a night in a small Illinois town in the late 1890s. And Thomas Shastid was an author of the early 20th century. He, for example, made the arguments that um, Lincoln may have been colorblind. And he describes the visit, a home visit, to a, to a child that was very sick. And uh, I'll just read you what he wrote. I found the boy very ill, the whole back of his throat being like a white velvet. I had never used the new remedy before for the term to try it to save the boy's life. I injected a small quantity under the skin of the stomach and watched the throat. I can only compare the marvelous result to the disappearance of snow beneath a hot sun. After the second dose, every trace of the membrane disappeared and the boons and the boys who recovered. This was a miracle cured in the 1890s, and he's talking about diphtheria and detoxin. Diphtheria was a disease that killed many, many children in the past. It's a horrible disease, and the way of death is horrible. A membrane falls in the back of the throat, and the children asphyxiate in front of their parents. The only thing that could be done was to do an emergency tracheostomy. And you can think about doing an emergency cut during that time and what the consequences were. But this was developed and adapted and it resulted in the first time that physicians could treat an infectious disease specifically and rapidly. So the end of the story begins in 1891 with Emil von Behring and Shiba Kirasaro. And what they showed was that immunity could be transferred by serum. Serum is the liquid part of the blood. And this, this had been known for a long time that you could, for example, Jenner has shown that you could immunize against smallpox. But the idea that you could transfer immunity was one of those landmark experiments in the history of science that ushered a lot of the growth of immunology. Led to the first Nobel Prize. Uh, this was so dramatic that, uh, that the first prize that was given was given to Emma von Behring, and it was given for the treatment of uh, antitoxin. And so what you see, here, you see here is that what I'm gonna be talking to you about is old, very old. It's been around for a long time, and there's a lot of experience with it. I, in fact, Fiviger carried out the first randomized controlled trial in medicine in 1898 to evaluate diphtheria antitoxin. So today you hear about randomized controlled trials, blinded and all these things. What he did was he randomized the patients to either serum or no serum, depending on the day of the week. And he showed that the mortality of the serum treated group was significantly lower. They didn't have statistics then, but the, but the chi-square was invented two years later. And if you apply it to this data, uh, you will see that it's a very significant p-value. He went on to get the Nobel Prize in 1927 for showing that worms cause stomach cancer. It turned out to be a completely incorrect, and it led the Nobel Committee to stop giving prizes for people uh, recently discovered. It used to be that Nobel said that a prize must be for the greatest discovery in the prior year, but it was clear by that time that you probably should let the discovery age a bit to, to be right. And this was one of the few times in which the Nobel Prize has given for something that was uh, completely wrong. So serum therapy went on to become the standard therapy. The, the, um, today we have remainings of that time through serum. Pneumococcal pneumonia, for example, was treated with with serum and it reduced the mortality by half. Today, the mortality is about 10% with, with antibiotics. So you see that most of the, what was gained was relatively little compared to what they had and the same for meningococcal meningitis. Here is an advertisement from Leatherly, a company that went out about three decades ago, but may began a serum company. High-tech pharma around 1910 involves making serum in horses and preparing the serum. And the, this ushered a tremendous amount of work and growth in immunology. For example, when this was done, they didn't know what antibodies, that there were antibodies for protein. 
All that had to be worked out in the decades after that. However, it was difficult to use. You needed to know what you were doing. For example, in treating pneumococcus, you needed to type it. You could not treat pneumococcal type one with serum from pneumococcal type two. And this was very sophisticated therapy. They didn't have IV sets. They needed to be able to either inject it or drip it at the time. And this was one of the reasons that as soon as antimicrobials were discovered, serum therapy was largely abandoned. So the heyday is between 1900 and 1940. It was used for treating many diseases, diphtheria, pneumococcus, meningococcus, rabies, measles, anthrax, tularemia. But then antimicrobials arrive, and then the field of infectious diseases walks away from it. Today, most of the antibodies that I use in clinical medicine are used in rheumatology and in, in cancer. Very few are in infectious diseases. So where did the antibody come from? Well, there were two sources. If you could grow the bacteria or the organism, you could immunize an animal. And then you could take the, the immune sera from the animal and use it to treat. And they used horses, rabbits, or chickens, even chickens. And these provided large amounts of serum. And the advantage was that it was available. You could keep it in the freezer and you could use it. However, when it came to viruses, they did not have any virology. They could not grow viruses in culture. So they had to depend on human convalescence sera. By that, I mean they had to wait for people to recover, and then they would take their blood, spin it down, and use it. So these were diseases where there was no animal model, primarily viral diseases. So the problem was always supply and logistics. You had an epidemic, you had to get the stuff, you needed people to recover. And at the time, they had no knowledge of blood-associated diseases, hepatitis, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about that. So today, though, we call it convalescent plasma. What is the difference between plasma and zero and sera? Well, when it comes to the active ingredient, there is no difference. They both contain antibody, but they are prepared differently. Antibody Plasma, generally, you get it from a plasma freezer machine. And what it does is you sit down and they take your, the plasma off, which is the liquid. It contains all the coagulation factors. Serum is more primitive. What you do is you collect the blood and you let it clot. And then you spin down the clot. And that is generally depleted of coagulation factors. But the important thing to know is that they both have the same ingredient, which is antibodies, and that you could use it to treat people or to prevent disease. So this, and this has been going around now for 130 years. In fact, convalescent serum plasma was used in many uh, past epidemics. It was used in 1918, I'll be talking more about that. And it'd be using numerous outbreaks up to about 1950. You can see that even that paper as late as 1946, preventing orchitis, that is testicular inflammation in mumps by the administration of human convalescent uh, sera. Uh, so what you should know is that in that time, they, didn't, they used the word serum. They didn't have the technology for plasma. Today we use plasma. But remember, when it comes to the active ingredient, they are the same. Here is data from 1918, a soldier with influenza pneumonia. And you probably can't read it, but this soldier is getting into trouble. It's starting to breathe very rapidly. And one of the things that happens when you breathe so rapidly is you cannot keep it up. And after a while, you begin to tire, you retain CO2, and that's how you die. And uh, that's why people go on respirators today, because the respirator breathes from you and it's able to maintain you. So what happened is that the soldier is given serum, and you could see a very rapid uh, the effervescence, the fever goes away, and the respiratory rate improves. Um, this was uh, common. This is uh, obviously a single case we're looking at. But one of the important lessons, just like I read to you about that episode in, in an Illinois small town at the beginning, when you recover from, from when antibody-mediated recovery is often very rapid, people get very rapid responses to the administration of antibodies. So in the early 2000, 
Uh, Dr. Luke carried out this analysis. He pulled out the major studies from 1918, and he showed that when you did a meta-analysis, that it dropped mortality by about 20%. However, antibody therapies are abandoned in the 1940s and 50s. There are two reasons for that. For bacterial diseases, anti you have penicillin, sulfonamides, tetracycline, serum cannot compete with them. These are easier to use, and they are often more effective. I point out to you through this mailbox, it says trash the axis, by buying bonds, and under it says, penicillin cures gonorrhea in four hours. Today, unfortunately, penicillin is not useful against gonorrhea because gonorrhea is drug resistant, but it gives you a sense of the advancement that came with penicillin. This is from a advertising at the time, thanks to penicillin, he will come home. For plasma, they discovered hepatitis. And this was the result of co using convalescent plasma. This is one of the early uh, findings in which uh, astute physicians noticed that when they used it, in particular, this episode in England in which it was pulled, a lot of the kids came down with hepatitis. They became yellow, and three of them died. And this was the reason that plasma was abandoned by 1950. And it wasn't until we developed tests for testing for HIV, hepatitis, that plasma undergoes a renaissance. So the data from that time lead us to three principles. These were never written down. In fact, I'm writing a paper about this, simply because they were thought to be common knowledge at the time. In 1940, any physician would have agreed with them. First, you need a specificity principle. You need to have antibody that is uh, that is, uh, that is to bind the microbe targeted. The quantitative principle, you have to have sufficient antibody to do so. And then the temporal principle that antibody works best if given early. This is data from 1913 from Flexner, the brother of the person who, revel who reformed medicine. And you could see that mortality increases the longer you wait to treat people. So here you have convalescent plasma efficacy in several epidemics. So from 1918, it reduces mortality. You can see that against Junin virus in Argentina, the best done randomized control trial drops by about 93%. It was used for SARS, CoV-1. It was used in 19, uh, 2009 against influenza. And we have carried out a meta-analysis that suggests it's dropping mortality today by about 57%. That number may change. But there have been at least two cases in which the efficacy, it didn't work. And it didn't work very well. Against Ebola virus, one of the studies showed that it dropped mortality by about 18%. But when you took all the confounders, this went down to 8%, and it was not significant. And for seasonal flu, a study that was carried out by the NIH recently showed no effect. So can we do a post-mortem in these studies based on what we know? And the answer is yes. If you look at the Ebola story, it turns out that they did not know the amount of antibody in the plasma that they use. Basically, they asked people, do you have Ebola? The person said yes. So that they, then they, they used that blood. But when they went back and checked, as many as a third of the unit did not have antibody explaining why that trial may not have been as effective. And then for the fluke study, there were two problems. One, they gave it late. 44% were in the ICU with advanced disease. And then they used titers that were relatively low. So these, the negative results can be explained uh, based on, on the principles of antibody mediated protection. So I wanna, before I go to that, I wanna tell you about Cuba Libre. So this is the drink for the night. It was invented in the early 1900s. Uh, United States occupied Cuba after the American War, and they thought of keeping it. But after a while, Cuba had been a, an unruly place, and they thought better of it, and Cuba was granted independence in, in 1902 with an amendment to the Constitution known as the Platt Amendment that allowed the United States to intervene any time that they, that they wanted. This is something you grow up when you uh, in Cuba, and this is what fosters a lot of anti-American angst. But the US soldiers brought Coca-Cola to Cuba, and the Cubans had rum. 
And there is a story, we don't know how well it is, that there were soldiers in a bar and there were some Cubans drinking rum and somebody mixed the two of them and that's how it got invented. I found this picture of the American occupation of Cuba and you can see the Cuban flag and the American flag and I can't make out what's in the middle. Some personal history, I am Cuban. I come from the middle of the island um, and I came to the United States at the age 11. In fact, on, on Friday, I would have been, it's the anniversary of my arrival in the United States. I arrived here on September 25th, 1968. And via Spain, we left legally, we went to Spain, my brother and I and my father. My mother couldn't get out, she got out later. And this is on boarding the plane to the United States. And these clothes were get, where you get them at a, at a place in which you can collect hand-me-down. And I am remarkably how well they fit, but you can see that, um, that uh, they, they, they're kind of odd uh, for that. But they were, they got, they got through immigration and we settled, went to live in Ohio for a while and then settled in Queens. And I lived in New York until I came to Hopkins about five, six years ago. So it's January. Uh, I'm an infectious disease doctor. I know a lot of history. I'm very worried that this is not containable. I'm listening very carefully to all our authorities. They're talking about antivirals, monoclonals, vaccines, but I don't hear the word plasma. And I don't know what to do about it. How do I get the word out? Well, uh, I thought of writing an editorial in a medical journal, but you know, those are not going to go anywhere. You needed to get some place that it would get a bang. So I decided to write an op-ed, send it to New York Times, you send it to them, you wait three days, you don't hear anything. Then I send it to the Washington Post, you don't hear anything. And finally, like everything in life, it's all luck. I send it to the Wall Street Journal on a day in which the market tanked because of the COVID and they took it. And uh, this was a story that I used to basically rile a lot of people to do this. So how a boy's blood stopped an outbreak. And uh, this is the story. I was familiar with this case. This is Roswell Gallagher who was the doctor in the school. The school's still there. He was a school physician at the Hill School in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. And there was a boy that came down with measles, but he had 66 kids that had no measles. So he waited for the boy to recover. He then took some of his took serum out of the blood, uh, out, of the, out of the boy, and he gave it to the others. And 10 cc's of serum, he expected 25 cases. Since they're all being exposed, he ended up with three, and they were all attenuated. It shows you uh, how, this, how powerful this can be. Uh, it also shows you that what it could be done in 1935, no IRVs. Uh, you basically, they basically did what they thought needed to be done and they certainly have no knowledge about bloodborne diseases. So I took the op-ed, I then, once you have an op-ed, you can get people to react, and I began to sending it to all my friends. Uh, in fact, Al Summer read it and corrected it for me, which I'm very glad for, but in 600 words, the uh, Wall Street Journal uh, ended up re rewriting it, and it was a lot better than anything I could have written, and some of my friends got activated. So Michael Joyner is at Mayo, He's an anesthesiologist. He's never heard about plasma, but he knows that in the United States, there is a whole system for plasma collection because he uses plasma all the time in the operating room. So he activates Mayo, he activates other friends, and then within days, a, a collection of friends begins to emerge. And this is pretty much it. This was the contacts. I must have sent it to hundreds of people, and these are the people who responded. Uh, so my friend Lizzie and Peroskir Einstein brought in the New York connection. Nigel Panis is an epidemiologist at Michigan State University. He brought, he activated Michigan and they in fact put in a, the website for this group. Michael Joyner, I told you about, he will become really important because he will get the contract from BARDA to do what is the extended use protocol. Uh, he then contacted Jeff Henderson and Brenda, uh, Brenda Grossman. And here at, at um, Hopkins, Shmuel Shoham, I had a meeting with infectious disease and he volunteered. He said, I'll write the protocol. So this was a kind of a, an, an odd group 
uh, you don't see virologists, you don't see many immunologists, you see epidemiologists, ID, anesthesiologists, uh, people working uh, together to try to deploy this at a time in which none of this existed in the United States. So we rapidly formed the National COVID Plasma Project. This is the website. The website is built by Amazon. We basically began people helping us. Amazon donated the programmers and we had a website within three days and we needed a place to put it. And the Dean of Michigan State, Univer uh, Michigan State University said to Nigel Paneth, put it up if they sue us, too bad. And the site is up and you can click on it and the site becomes critical because we're getting by now thousands of emails. We need to begin to distribute information and we need a place in which people can go click and download stuff. So, um, so this is around mid-March. And so March, things now move really fast. So here is the op-ed. I send the op-ed to all my friends. We have discussions at Hopkins. Hopkins assembles an, a group, which includes people from transfusion medicine, as well as from the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine. And then <laughs> we realize that you can't write an IRB protocol with an op-ed, you need to have references, you need to have a lot of stuff. So Lizzie and Porosky and I write an emergency paper for the Journal of Clinical Investigation, I'll show you in a minute. And I'm in touch with Al Summer. So Al becomes critical. So he's connected to the Lasker because he's one of the people on the advisory board. But here he plays a critical role because he was able to connect us with Bloomberg philanthropies and then Michael Bloomberg steps in and gives three million bucks, and Larry Hogan steps in and gives one million bucks to Governor of Maryland. And this is the only money that is going to be available until mid June. And we use that money to set up clinical trials and to put the infrastructure in place that could then be rapidly grown in the United States. And by March 24th, three weeks later, the FDA already arounds compassionate use, and the first patient is treated in March 27th. So one month between the op-ed and the first patient treated. In the case, this is what I call COVID time. Things are moving very fast. And behind the scene, what's going on is that I have my 15 minutes of fame uh, in which, you know, there was no therapy available. Uh, the, the media all wanted to talk to me. So I began to give a lot of interviews. And guess what happens? People are listening. So docs all over the country begin to write to the FDA asking them for permission to use plasma. The FDA doesn't want to have an, in, an, an uh, investigational new drug application for every hospital in the United States. So what they do is they issue a contract to the Mayo Clinic to run what becomes the extended access protocol. And you will be here. This is the EAP. So the Mayo Clinic now begins to collect all this information. And by April 4th, any doctor in the United States can write uh, can, can go to the FDA website, register their patient, and get plasma. And then the, uh, but before that, I want to tell you what happened is I had a bit of a crisis, and the crisis was a science crisis. There had been many papers in the literature about antibody dependent enhancers. What does it mean? It means that antibodies to coronavirus can make things worse. And here I am, you know, going in all these news. Uh, CNN and Fox News and whatever, and a lot of people begin to write back, uh, many members of the National Academy, virologists, immunologists, write me and says, Arturo, there is this literature and this can be a problem. And, you know, my reaction to it is I know about the literature and I read about the literature, but, uh, but the question is, do we go, do we worry about it or do we don't? So my approach was to really deep, uh, dig deeply into this. And the more I read, the less concerned I was. Most of the, of the um, antibody dependent enhancement literature was in very contrived systems. And I, looking at the literature, looking at history, I really didn't think that we were gonna be hurting anybody by taking blood from somebody who recovered and was walking around and giving it to somebody who was sick. There was a long history of convalescent plasma in patients with viral pneumonia, suggesting that it was beneficial. It had been used in SARS in 2003. By that time, there were reports from China that it was favorable. And, and the question is, 
what do I do? So as you can tell, I'm very interested in history. So I thought the wisdom of antiquity. And if you go to the wisdom of antiquity, you can find two pieces of, of wisdom was Audentes Fortuna Jubat, which is uh, basically can be translated as fortune favors the bold. It's being given to many, so go for it. Fortune will favor it. But there was also a warning from Democritus that boldness is the beginning of action, but fortune controls how it ends. So antiquity didn't really help very much. So uh, in mid, my March 14th, Texas contacted me. Here is the email. Hi, Arturo. I hope you're well and, and SARS free. We are beginning to think about this. Realistically, do you think there's a need for serum in this disease? Okay, this is intriguing. So the Jim Mosser and Eric Salazar at Methodist Hospital, after an email exchange, which was, I think, on a Sunday night, we went back and forth a bunch of times, uh, they put the, the IND, the IRB, the paperwork, and they are the first patient to be treated. I get an email that they done this, and I, that night I cannot sleep. I'm worried about everything. Uh, and I, I'll be honest with you, even though I was pretty sure that antibody-dependent enhancement was not a problem, I'm not arrogant enough to think that, you know, I know everything. And I was worried, so I kept checking my phone all night long, thinking that I would get an email that, you know, maybe the paper, the patient went into some sort of uh, crisis, and it didn't happen. In fact, more and more patients are treated in the next few days, and there appears to be no issue whatsoever with the administration of plasma. The FDA now moves very rapidly. By, by April 3rd, allows the use of plasma in the United States, and in particular, expands it because physicians are asking, I don't want to use it just compassionately. I want to use it earlier. And then Michael Joyner and Scott Wright uh, basically become the PIs of the extended uh, the extended the uh, access protocol. And their job is to record everything that's happening with this patient. This is a contract by BARDA run from the Mayo Clinic under the Mayo IRB. So these are the two publications. Like one of them is the manifesto. This is the one that I wrote with Lizanne emergently mid-March. And you can see that I'm still using the word Sierra. And we, after we wrote all this, we realized, oh my God, there is a lot more we got to get down if people are going to do this. So one of them is the manifesto and the other one is the how-to guide. And this was led by the two transfusion mavens here, Evan Block and Aaron Tobias. And by then I graduated to modernity. So I'm using the word plasma. So now the unexpected happened. The FDA did not expect that maybe a few hundred to maybe a thousand patients will be treated. Instead, thousands of patients are treated in the United States. Most of the usage is occurring outside randomized clinical trials. Why? Because the randomized clinical trials are set up in New York, in Boston, and now the epidemic has moved away. They have no patients. Donation campaigns ensure a steady supply of convalescent plasma. The Orthodox community mobilizes in New York and generates tens of thousands of plasma units. So the United States has an ample supply of plasma. Usage is driven by physicians who have embraced it. So it's May, and now criticism begins to mount. How could the FDA allow this to happen without safety and efficacy data? So I'm working with Mike and, the, and with the FDA, and the question is, can we use this enormous database that is growing by a thousand people every day to provide answers to safety and efficacy? Before I tell you that, I want to talk to you about the enormous efforts of the Orthos community, and in particular, Chaim Lebowitz, who organize uh, donors in, in New York, in many cities in the United States, and the United States was able to have an adequate supply of plasma initially, and this was before all the, all the uh, uh, other campaigns uh, took off. But I, I greatly uh, admire the organizational ability of Haim and, and, and what was done, and I believe that they're responsible for saving many, many lives. So the first question is, is it safe? So this was relatively easy to answer, and we had an answer by May. Uh, we looked at the first 5,000 patients, and there was really no evidence whatsoever 
that there was anything untoward. And then about a month later, we had enough data for 20,000 patients and the side effects associated with plasma were even lower than is reported for plasma. And the reason for that is simple. Most of the plasma in hospitals is used for bleeding problems and, and doctors give a lot of it. And there are complications of giving large volume. But in this case, they're giving relatively small amounts, 200 uh, cc's, and there was, uh, there was none. But this now becomes very important because safety mean if you have safety, that means that you can do other things. And in particular, safety will clear the way for monoclonal antibodies, vaccines, and other reagents that are coming. So, uh, so certainly we, we don't have to worry about antibody-dependent enhancement. We don't have to worry about cytokine storms. It appears that, that convalescent plasma is as safe as plasma. So it's working. Well, today there are three main, there are many encouraging reports and three major lines of evidence. So the first one I'm going to be telling you about is going to be the EAP data analysis. There are about 10 observational studies from all over the world, Sinai, New York City, Methodist Hospital, Hackensack, Italy, Iran, et cetera. I'll show you some of the data from it. And there are now five randomized clinical trials. All have problems, but all provide some encouragement. So let's take a look at some of these. First, let's look at the extended access protocol. This is the uh, data that was used for the, by the FDA for the extended use of authorization. And look, here you don't have a, a negative control. And when you read about the, <laughs> the reports in the, in the media, it's crazy because they always say, well, they didn't have a negative control. Of course, we don't have a negative control. We have thousands of treated patients. What's remarkable is if you look at the data, everybody has been treated. Everybody presumably has benefited. Can you find a signal of efficacy? And the answer is, we found two. If you give it early, your mortality is much lower than if you give it later. But this is the key piece of data. And you see a dose response. That is, when you give a high neutralizing antibody, the mortality is much lower than when you give low. And this is a 35 reduction in mortality. So this is the 35% number that was used to cause all the commotion uh, when this was released to the, to the media. But let's just stick to the science. If you look at it, here is the temporal principle back from the 1940s. You have to give it early. Here is the specificity principle. It must contain antibody to SARS-CoV-2. And here is the quantitative principle, which is you, you, you need to have enough and uh, to, to get an effect. And independent of these, the Israelis are carrying out a study and they come to the same conclusion. So independently, this is now validated from a, a, a very, very different type of study. This is Sinai in, uh, in New York City. They, uh, they show that, the mini that if you give it before the unit, bef before people going to intensive care unit, there is a major reduction in mortality. Same thing in Houston, Methodist. Uh, if you give it before the unit, they had the one, some of the largest studies. Plasma is given within 72 hours for three days using high tidal plasma. You could see how the, the survival curves uh, separate. So um, the first randomized study is now done in China, but they have to stop it because they ran out of patients. So they originally planned for something like 600 patients. They ran out of patients at 200 and they reported. So even though they cannot make any conclusions about mortality, what they show is that if you give it early, before people go into the unit, there is a significant difference in improvement. And we wrote the editorial for this and pointed out that this is essentially what you get with remdesivir. So again, uh, not conclusive for mortality, but as good as remdesivir. The Spaniards have carried a randomized uh, control trial that was prematurely ended this summer. They see no mortality, zero, in the group that got the plasma, and in the, uh, and the a, a stati almost a statistical significant difference uh, in the ones that are not plasma treated. And they also see no progression to the ICU. The Iraqis are reporting a randomized control trial that was <coughs> no blinded. But you can see the data here. Patients treated with convalescent plasma, they have one death. And in the other group, they have eight. 
and they did achieve uh, statistical significance. So let's look at the five controlled trials that are out there. We have one from China. Uh, I stopped prematurely. They dropped mortality, but it didn't reach significance. The Netherlands stopped prematurely too. They're also with patient issues, and they don't reach more. They drop mortality, but it's not significance. The Spaniards almost get significance. They get a 0.05. The Indians report no drop in mortality. So this is the only study out there in which it seems not to affect mortality. But they still drop viral load. They still drop the oxygen requirement and fever. And then when you look at the data, they have a problem. 27% of their units have no antibody or very low antibody, and they used it very late. So this can be explained on two issues, the quantitative principle and the temporal principle. And here is the, Iran the Iraqi study that they also got, they got significance and they dropped recovery time and mortality. So what's striking to me is these different houses Randomized controlled trials is the best epistemic data you can get. So whether it is in New York, whether it is in Spain, Iraq, you're beginning to get, everyone is reporting some uh, degree of benefit. When you do a carry out a meta-analysis of all this data, most of them are underpowered. So they by themselves cannot achieve significance, but when you put them all together, there is a suggestion, uh, it's statistically significant that uh, our plasma administration is reducing mortality. You begin to get increasing numbers of anecdotal case reports, immunocompromised. In fact, this morning it was reported, the largest one, 27 patients, in which the administration of plasma to immunocompromised patients results in the clearance of the virus. And these are important because immunocompromised patients are a particular risk. You're never gonna have a controlled trial in, in this population. But for example, here you have a child which is a refractory to remdesivir, and then they give plasma and it clears the virus. You know, they, it, it's consistent to and supportive. My opinion on efficacy, well, there is strong precedence for, based on historical use. There is a strong theoretical support for the knowledge of antibody action. You have encouraging signs from greater than 14 studies, including this should, should be updated, five randomized controlled trials. And you have the data from the extended access protocol that showed a clear dose response and large reduction in mortality. So my opinion changes by the month. Back in March, when I was giving all those interviews, I would have said to you, maybe it's worth trying. And then over the months, it gets better. I think I'm at a good likelihood that this is working. I think that as a scientist, you always have to remain with some uh, equipoise. Uh, and I hope to be able to say definitively in the future, but I would like to see some really good randomized control data. And here at Hopkins, as a result of the efforts of SAR, which gave, we got money that put the trials in place, we then were able to secure a large infusion of money from the Department of Defense that has allowed us to have large, randomized, double-blind, controlled, multi-center trials across the United States. And there are two major trials. One of them is prophylaxis. If you have a family at home in which somebody has COVID, if you give plasma to those who are not infected, do you prevent infection? Shmo Shohami is doing that. And David Sullivan is doing a very different study. These are people that are sick at home. If you give them a unit of plasma, do you prevent them from, from getting sicker? And if that is the case, uh, it's going to be very, very important because it means that you could stop disease from ever from going into a hospital. That's the end point, going into the hospital. And then Hanley, with a lot of experience in clinical trials, is supervising uh, the whole effort. I want to point out that convalescent plasma appears to have different effects when used early or late. If you give it early, patients don't have their own antibody, so you're giving something that, uh, that helps the immune system. If you give it late, when patients have their own antibody, you would suspect that this won't work. But it turns out that it works in reducing virus. So what's going on here? What's going on here is that the antibodies that you make in the convalescent period are better than the antibodies that you make when you're sick. And now we just have a paper accepted, precisely showing that, that the antibodies made in the acute and convalescent are, are different. Uh, and again, it's just suggesting 
we will have to figure out when is the best time to take antibodies from recovering patients. But uh, at least everything is fitting in in terms of science and immunology. Summary of the available data, if you give antibody, you can reduce viral load, it reduces inflammation. That in turn reduces the amount of oxygen one needs. You see radiological improvement. And when you put all these things together and you have a large enough trial, there is a, you know, I don't know what, what descriptor you want me to use, but there is, uh, the data are all pointing to improved survival. So in August 23rd, the FDA issued emergency use authorization for convalescent plasma. I would point out to you that by that time, something like 60 or 70,000 people have been treated. So the United States was already operating in those conditions, but it, but it was a problem. Poor hospitals and poor communities could not get it. So by doing this, the, the, EU, the FDA resolved an issue of equ equity. I would point out that the bar for this is reasonable safety and probable efficacy. And I think you would agree with me based on the data I showed you that we have reasonable efficacy and probable safety, and therefore we're very supportive of that. But as you began to read all over the papers, there began to be difference within the NIH and the FDA. There began to be questions, you know, criticism, how these things are being made. Etc. I'm not going to get into the politics of this, but I would just point out to you that this issues issue differences in certainty. And in science, we have a mechanism for conflict resolution. We get more data and do randomized controlled trials. Uh, my job gets uh, made harder uh, every time you hear plasma in the news because the <laughs> you name it, uh, the, the reporters want to talk to me. And but I'm very happy that this is uh, about a week ago. You can read the headlines, plus plasma look promising. as a promising COVID-19 treatment and Trump got involved. Uh, Trump plasma therapy officials worry it's an embedded vaccine next. One of my great accomplishments was that my name is not in none of, in none of those uh, uh, reports. Uh, however, I would point out to you that I have worked with the FDA and I have worked with our scientists and I, the FDA was ready to do this back in June, and they have been extremely cautious. And I have nothing but good things to say about uh, our government scientists and the regulators. And today, uh, we published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, uh, arguing that this debate is good for science. Look, this is not a debate. People are not saying this doesn't work. What you have is a debate about certainty. And what you need is more data. And one of the great things about this is that the NIH has gotten involved and has poured a lot of money now into additional clinical trials. So we went from a lot of use with no clinical trials to an enormous amount of work going on. And I think we're gonna have a great data to know definitively in a few months time. Uh, this is, gives you a sense, what I call the epistemic climb. So you could imagine that when that paper I wrote five months ago, all we had was historical precedent and immunological memory. Since then, the antibody mechanisms were worked out, case series reported favorable results, human convalescent plasma protected in animal models, 12 studies with match controls, DAP analysis that I told you about with 35,000 patients. And you can see here is the FDA, first FDA action on March 24th and the second FDA action in, um, in, uh, in August uh, 23rd. So the situation today is a convalescent plasma available throughout the United States for the treatment of COVID-19. Uh, when um, the United States is under emergency use authorization, that means that a doctor can write an order, uh, uh, an order for this, and we plasma is available. Uh, think about the accomplishments here. None of this was available on March 1st. Supplies are plentiful as a result of recruitment campaigns. I would point out to you that this is uh, unprecedented uh, in many ways. The deployment of plasma has been driven by physician scientists. There is no pharmaceutical company involved or supporting this. No one's gonna make any money. There are no patents. This is a therapy that has been generated in people and generated locally. And it is a very, very pure type of work. Uh, and, uh, and we are all hopeful that it will work and we are hopeful that it is helping people already. Uh, 
certainty of efficacy varies on who you ask. The FDA states probable efficacy. I think we have certainly met that criteria. There are numerous randomized clinical trials underway, and more certainty as to efficacy can be expected in the next few months. I want to end with some final thoughts. Uh, this is, very, as I said, no pharmaceutical sponsors. This is a locally generated therapy. Uh, there are not going to be teams of lobbyists uh, or people working on regulators to do this. This is going to have to stand on whatever data gets generated by the various groups. Um, all units are different, and this makes it difficult. In fact, it is remarkable how far, how far we've gotten with a product in which every unit is, di is, is different, and yet it's been possible to standardize them to some degree. We know, for example, what, a, 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 what we think is an effective unit, how much antibody should have. This harks back to the past, a place many people may want to leave behind, but it has a great advantage. It's low tech and easily deployable. It's cheap. A unit of plasma is $300 and you only have to use it once. It can be available readily in very under-resourced regions. And I can tell you that a lot of therapies are coming, but the rest of the world is not gonna have them. But if they have patients who recover, they have, they're gonna, they have convalescent plasma. And it is our job to figure out how to use this and how to use this right so that information can be transferred to other parts of the world so that they can use it uh, better. It will continue to be used against COVID and it, will, and it will be there for the next epidemic. So one of the great responsibilities of our time is to figure out how to use it right so we leave future generations with a roadmap for when the next time it comes, how to, to use it. The current challenge is figuring out when, if, when, and how to use it effectively. Uh, the plasma experience has already produced a great result. It is safe. And by do, being safe, it's clear the way for monoclonals, gamma globulins, and vaccines. Prior to this, there was concern. In all the coronavirus vaccines has shown the phenomenon of antibody-dependent enhancement. I think that everybody's breathing a lot uh, calmer, that, 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 you know, that this is, we have to always keep it as a concern. You never rule out anything in particular when it comes to side effects, but it, it looks like it is a minor concern. And it remains the only therapy against COVID currently associated with major reductions in mortality if used before the ICU. That said, this is a stopgap therapy. It will be used only until we have better reagents. And last week, Lilly announced uh, a proof of concept data for neutralizing antibodies. And I think you would regenerate only cam monoclonals. Uh, many companies are making polyclonal reagents. I thought that, it, that in late September, they'd be here. They're not here. We are still depending on plasma. We will be using plasma for a while, but hopefully uh, plasma will provide a stopgap therapy that will teach us a lot, at least in, the, in resource areas that can then people use monoclonals and other things. And the rest of the world, can, we can, maybe we can figure out how to really use it well so that we can transfer that information uh, to other regions. And with that, I think I'm done. Thank you so much, Dr. Arturo Casadevall for the uh, fascinating talk and the um, wonderful research, life-saving. Um, we do have several questions. I'm going to remind people that they can raise their hands if they go down to the participants panel to ask verbally within their own voice the question, but I do have some questions that people have sent to me. You can do that on the chat panel, um, Dorian Devins, and uh, I have a few of them to start us off with here. So, um, we're going to start, uh, Lindsay asks, I'm curious about the importance of the diversity of the antibody response when it comes to convalescent plasma. How does the severity of a patient's response correspond to the ability of their plasma to potentially treat COVID-19? That is an excellent question. So in the early days, we didn't know. There were people who said, you know, you want it from the mild disease because these people didn't get very sick. Today, we know that, how, that you make a stronger response how, the, the sicker you get. So if, you, if you're in the unit, you will have a much stronger response than you're at home. So what we're trying to do is, we, there is already reports that some of those antibodies that are made by very sick people may not very, be very good. So currently, 
and I, like I said, all knowledge in science is provisional, is the best units appear to be people who are symptomatic. That they got sick, they got cough, they got short of breath, fever, but they did not progress to have to go to the hospital or to the intensive care unit. So those are the units that are appear to have a lot of antibody on. One of the concerns is that the antibodies drop rapidly in the, in the, in the few months afterwards. So you gotta catch people right. And that's what everyone is trying to target those units. Those are the ones that have been associated with efficacy in the in various studies. Okay, wonderful. Okay, our next question comes from Lou who says, how did they get diphtheria antitoxin in the 1890s? How did the doctor happen to have it? Uh, they knew that if you grew diphtheria, the, the uh, supernatant of the culture had toxin properties. So they didn't know anything about protein science. They couldn't isolate it. But they could always grow bacteria, spin down the bacteria, and work with what was in the supernatant. And that is what they often used to immunize. And they immunized with that, and then they showed that, that the, you mounted an antibody response. They didn't know what antibodies was. Eventually, they had to coin the word anticorp, uh, which becomes antibody. Is, this is the German literature. And that becomes the beginning of that. So you had great science done with, you know, without any of the tools that we today take for granted. OK. I have another one in to me. Uh, so far, nobody's brave enough to do in their own voice, but I'll remind them they can go to the participants panel and raise their hand and I'll call on them. But we have a question from Arundati who says, is the plasma from asymptomatics or recovered people? So the plasma is, the plasma that we're getting right now, some of them are, obviously they're all recovered. No, nobody has COVID uh, at that time. Some, some asymptomatic people mount a strong immune response, but though they happen to be the minority, the best, in, the, the best units are coming from people who were sick. Uh, so when they've been screening, for example, the blood supply, a lot, they're picking up a lot of people to have antibody because they had it, they were asymptomatic. Those tend to be low titer units, and those are being shifted to try to make gamma globulin. So what I say to anybody is, if you had COVID, please donate. Because if you have a lot of antibody, it could be used to, some, to help somebody. And if your antibody titers are low, it can still be used because it will go to a facility where they make gamma globulin. Great, we got a public service in there too. Public, public yeah. service announcement. <laughs> um, James T asks, does convalescent plasma therapy have an effect on post illness symptoms? Are treated patients less likely to have the fatigue, breathing issues, et cetera, than those who haven't had the treatment. It's funny you ask that because I was just an exchange with my friends in Methodist Hospital in Texas, and they were the first ones, and they have just published a study with three, almost 400 patients. They told me they have several hundred, and I said, why don't you follow up to see whether there is a difference in long haulers? Long haulers is this terminology that is coming down to people who seem to have symptoms that don't recover them, that, that don't recover fully. So, and I said, you know, maybe you can just get a fellow to call up every single one of them and try to figure out where they're at blinded and then look to the analysis. It may very well be that there is a difference uh, between the two and preferably be that if you got plasma, they're less likely to have long-term symptoms. Great, that's a new term, long haulers. That's a long, I, yeah, believe me, I didn't make it up. I heard it in the news. <laughs> Dan has a question. Do you think the efficacy of antibody treatment would be much higher than that, than what you observe with plasma? And also, if he gets treated with plasma, would it affect the efficacy of the vaccine he'd get in the future? Those are wonderful questions. The, first, the answer to the first one is, I don't know. Uh, monoclonals are preferred. Why? Because they are defined reagents. The regulators love it. You have a single molecule and you have a certain amount. Uh, plasma, every unit is different. And in fact, if you take my plasma one day and you take it two days later, you have two different units. Uh, but the, there is a big difference. A monoclonal antibody represents one molecule, one specificity, and one biological activity. Plasma has thousands of these activities. 
And there is already some suggestion that the more complex plasmas, for example, the ones that have IgM and IgG are more effective than the ones that have IgG only. So I think the jury is going to be out. I think obviously if monoclonals are available and they work, they're going to be preferred reagents for a variety of reasons, although they're going to be pretty expensive relative to, to plasma. Okay, we've got, um, got quite a few questions here. Um, William asks, if plasma benefits patients with COVID, how many units should you give them? Excellent question. So right now, uh, people, most, almost all the studies have used one unit. That's between two and 300 cc's of plasma. Some studies though are showing that if you use two units, you're likely to do better. And there is a suggestion in our data that, the, that units, by the way, don't even come in the same size. Think about that for a minute. Some units are 200, 250, and some of them are as many as 300. So if you look at volume as a function of efficacy, it does suggest that the more you get, the better you do. And there is a biological reason for that. If you were to get two units, you're hedging your bets because you're getting stuff from two people who recovered so you may have even more biological variability. Okay, we have a, this is not a question, but a comment. I think many of us share this. Uh, Inna wants to say, I wanted to thank the professor for the amazing work you're doing, saving lives. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the thanks should go to everybody else. I mean, the truth is that this has been an enormous effort by a lot of people. The people who wrote the protocols, the HIAM, the orthos community, these are the real heroes of this. They, this has been a ground roots effort. There has been no government organization. There has been no commercial organization. This has been driven by doctors and, and scientists and people who, who really, we're trying to do something here to, to try to reduce suffering in the middle of a calamity. And that's, that's really all there is to it. I work on fungal diseases and I look forward to the time in which I go back to worrying about the, <laughs> some of the other things I used to worry about. Sure. Yeah. Uh, lots of questions here. Jeff uh, says, based on your studies of convalescent plasma, what can you say about the characteristics of acquired immunity in patients who have re recovered from SARS-CoV-2? So what I can say is that I am very optimistic. I'm very optimistic that people mount neutralizing responses that are protective. And uh, that if you can do that with recovery, that means that we will probably have good vaccine. I don't know how long the immunity is going to last. Look, we know this thing eight months. Uh, I don't know uh, what it's going to last, but I'm not worried about that. I get a flu shot every year. And if we need to get a flu shot with coronavirus in it, as a, that's okay. But I'm, I, you know, looking at the, uh, at what, how people recover, the type of antibodies they make, how that antibody is active against the virus, uh, I, I don't, we're not dealing with HIV here. We're not dealing with influenza. We're dealing with a virus that our immune system, if it can get its hands around it, it can neutralize. And when it can't, when you get COVID, when you get disease, it appears to be a, a runaway immune system. Uh, that's where the damage is coming from. But I, uh, I think certainly that our immunity, our immune system, humanity has never presumably seen this virus before can certainly deal with it. So I'm very optimistic for vaccine. Okay, great. Um, what have we got here? Uh, Karazango says, does it make sense to pool the plasma units to make them more complex? Uh, yes, that co comes up a lot. So pluses and minuses. The pluses are that if you pull them all, you end up with a solution that is more complex and you could standardize. At least you know, what a unit is and everybody can get the unit. The problem is that, uh, you know, as an infectious disease doctor, you begin to take a risk because we know that even though the blood supply is extremely safe, it's extremely safe. I want to re repeat that, you know, we test for HIV, hepatitis, A, B, uh, B and C, and, and a bunch of other things, that the moment you pull it, then you increase the likelihood that you can get one unit that has something in it that then could cause trouble for many others. And that, by the way, was that they got into trouble in the 1930s because they were pulling convalescent plasma and they were giving it to large numbers of people. 
So one person with hepatitis could then, uh, could then give the disease to many. So I would prefer dealing with the complexity of different units rather than the, than, but that's my preference from looking at it from an infectious disease point of view. Okay, I actually have someone here, uh, Karen, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and ask your question, Karen. I was just wondering, is um, convalescent plasma therapy being used in the treatment of other viral infections we cur currently see, although not as numerous as uh, COVID infections? So the answer is no. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, think about it, almost it, convalescent plasma has always been used in emergency conditions. Uh, so, and, and for you to use it, you need to have some people recovered. So when Zika came by a few years ago, they mobilized to try to use convalescent plasma, in particular with pregnant women and things like that. But the problem went away before they had a system in place. In Africa, they used it emergently in Ebola. So one of the legacies that I would like to see is, I would like that our time leaves the future with at least a protocol for doing this. Because one of the things we learned, for example, in New York was, they, they wanted to do randomized controlled trials, but it takes a month to get by, by the, it took them a month and that even, and that to even set up, uh, even with the IRB being very cooperative and even with everybody working very hard. And what you, well, one of the things that I would like out of this time is that we leave the documents, what is needed for the next time when we get hit with bird flu or a new pox virus or something, that physicians can do things even faster than they could do now. So the answer to you a question is unfortunately no, but it could be used. And it may very well be that if this great enterprise experiment is successful, that this will give a tremendous boost to antibody therapies and that we may begin to see it, for example, in the use of seasonal flu, which kills 40 or 50,000 people every year. But you could develop the same thing that we use now for treating the flu in the, in the winter. I have a question that may have been covered by that, but um, I'm, I'm gonna throw it in. It's from RAF. One of the criticisms of the emergency use authorization was that it removes the incentive for doing randomized controlled trials and perhaps suggests that the necessary equipoise is not present and such trials should not be performed. Given that you think this therapy certainly works, how do you square with the need to do RCTs? Would you agree to be randomized or would you just be treated off study through EUA? So what I want to say is that, that you, know, you, you need to know the history here. The randomized control trials were set up. And they were set up in the re parts of the country that then controlled the surge. The, 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 the use of the, the criticism was driven by doctors. The overwhelming majority of units were given in hospitals in which there was no chance whatsoever to get a randomized control trial. Community hospitals not tertiary centers. So I think you begin to get into some ethical and dicey uh, situations here. I believe that you need to do the randomized controlled trials. The randomized controlled trials are being done. The ones that we are doing, for example, in the outpatient space, there is no problem with the, with the EAP or the EUA. This, because they're happening in the outpatient space. So we may be able to establish definitively in conditions in which the patients are not on steroids, rendisivir, or anything like that, the efficacy of plasma. And that information can be transferred. So what I would say is that these are the criticisms that have been in, in the media, and many doctors have basically repeated them, but I feel that they have been uninformed. Uh, and they don't take into account the complexity of what happened here, and the fact that this was driven by doctors in places where they had nothing and they certainly did not have access to randomized controlled trials. So you get into, into ethical uh, issues, and I would just say that I would leave it to the ethicists to work it out. I don't think that the uh, extended access protocol hinders the randomized controlled trials. The randomized controlled trials got into trouble because the epidemic was controlled. And then the EAP drove the, the use in the parts of the country that it was surging where there was no chance to set up a randomized clinical trial because they were in the middle of, of, of a crisis. So it's a very complex story and I, I urge everybody to think it through 
before before they go around basically repeating that or or taking one position or the other. This was a complex story, and uh, but a lot has gotten done in in six months. I don't feel that harm has been done. I feel that a lot has been learned, and certainly plasma has cleared the way for a lot of the other antibody therapies. Thank you. Um, Lauren has a question. Um, does convalescent plasma have to be typed as whole blood transfusions yes. are typed? That's easy. That's easy. Yes. Yes. Okay. Type um, A, type A. <laughs> got it. Okay. Uh, Lindsay had another question about, um, and I'm going to pronounce it wrong, remdesivir. When remdesivir. Is it, remdesivir. When is it normally, what is it normally used to treat, and why is this considered as a promising COVID treatment, which I think you may have. So remdesivir is an antiviral. It interferes with viral replication. Uh, look, the antivirals have been the great success story of the HIV, the post-HIV era. Uh, I believe that it's not a very good antiviral compared to the other antivirals that we have, but it's there. It's associated with faster recovery. Uh, certainly, it's what we got. I believe that in a year or two, you're going to see really potent antivirals that really shut down replication. There are going to be drugs comparable to the miracle drugs that have converted HIV from a 100% lethal disease when I was a resident to something with a, a normal lifestyle, a, a normal uh, life expectancy today. Um, Mike G has a question. What factors distinguish viral pathogens to which the body can gain some degree of immunity, such as chickenpox, and viral pathogens for which the body does not gain such immunity? So it's, it's, it's a great and complicated answer, and the answer is each one of these viruses is different. Uh, for a virus to survive, think for a minute, it needs a host. So every virus is an expert at defeating immunity in some way or another. If they can't defeat immunity, they go extinct. They have very different strategies. HIV, for example, generates swarms of variants, so the immune system can catch up. Others are highly infectious, like measles, and jump from person to person. So what I would say is that uh, every virus has a different strategy. The strategies are, are, are unique in many ways, but here we're dealing with coronavirus, in which it appears to be new to humanity, and it appears that we are lucky enough to mount a neutralizing response. And that is very good news uh, for controlling this and putting it back in a bottle. Okay, Brown has a question. Um, are you aware or involved in any genomic work around genotypes that result in creating stronger response and specific ABs? For example, are specific genotypes within the immune system more valuable in creating successful AB response and therefore stronger plasma to use in, on others? So that's an excellent question. I'm personally not involved in that, but I can tell you that, that with sequencing technology, the amount of genomes that have been done is enormous. I would not be surprised if a year from now, somebody would say this virus induces stronger immunity. This virus, this strain is more likely to put you in the ICU. And I would not be surprised if asthma use is affecting the evolution of the virus. Because, you know, in many ways, the, the plasma use in the United States is putting a selection pressure on it. Probably not big because most of it is happening in the community and most of the people are not being treated, but it's still there. Uh, so I think that's a great question. And I, I think that it's, it's open-ended what the answer is going to be. Yes. Um, Wendy asks, would mutations in the virus impact plasma therapy? Yes, potentially. So the way the, way the plasma works is the antibodies bind to the spike protein, they, they prevent entry, and they do a lot of things. So you can imagine that a mutation that affected the structure of the plasma, of the, of the spike protein, would affect plasma efficacy. But here is the caveat. In plasma, you have a lot of very different antibodies. You have a lot of biological diversity. So it's going to be very hard for a virus to get away from plasma with a single mutation. But that could be a bigger problem for monoclonal antibodies because monoclonal antibodies are often honed in on a very small part that is very important for neutralization. So I think that that is a vulnerability for monoclonal reagents. Uh, and this is why people are already thinking of using cocktails so that you can hit the virus in multiple places to avoid this. 
we have um, Arundhati again um, asks, are there any data sets of studies complete, com completed publicly available? And also, are there possibilities for students to help or get involved? I'm sorry, data sets of which of the plasma? Data sets of studies. Um, so the, that are available so everything, publicly. I mean, everything I presented to you is in the public domain. The actual data sets are often under HIPAA regulations and things like that that are hard to get a, one's hands of. But, uh, you know, uh, but it, this, provided that the safeguards are put in place with the IRB or something, they can be studied by others. I think that there is enormous database data sets being collected. For example, the EAP, 100,000 people have been treated in the United States with plasma alone. That is going to be, have to be mined for many, many years. Consequences, response to vaccines, long hauler effects. You can just imagine uh, all the studies that will be done there. And, and the final question I have actually is from Aranjati who says, are there possibilities for students to help or get involved? I'm sure there are. I think the problem is finding the match uh, uh, simply because uh, mostly, for example, oral labs are still not at full capacity. Uh, we are not taking students on the graduates or only graduate students can go. And a lot of this um, requires a, um, you know, to have the right permissions, the right IRB and things like that. So the answer is yes, with the caveat that it's going to take some work to do that. Okay. Well, that's our that was our final question that I got. Um, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Arturo Casadevall. What a fantastic talk, and for all your life saving work, and um, for being so great at explaining it.